Good afternoon, Dr. Roland. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I got involved in the study of argument like a lot of people of my generation because I was a debater. And I debated at the University of Kansas. As a high school student, I never went to a debate workshop. And, but as I was exposed to debate in college, it occurred to me that my colleague and I, I thought we could be as good as anybody. And I remember the first time we debated Harvard and thinking they had all these advantages, but in public argument, all the advantages that they had didn't make any difference if we had better evidence and we had better arguments, and we had a better way of explaining it. And I thought that was a very appealing method of decision-making, and it was fun to beat them, too. And uh, so that's kind of what got me into the study of, of public argument. Well, you, uh, you have a specific honor with debate, too, if I remember correctly. Isn't that true? Uh, my, my colleague and I won the 1976 National Debate Tournament. We were in the semis the following year, but I'm especially proud of coaching a national championship when I was the director of forensics at Baylor. And so um, I, I, haven't been, I haven't been actively involved in debate for uh, 30 years now. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to have Scott Harris at, at the University of Kansas. But debate was transform transformational in my life. And I was able to work with Don Parson at KU and David Zarefsky and Tom Goodnight at Northwestern and a host of uh, important people who were uh, graduate students at KU at the time, including Bill Balthrop. So I, I was utterly blessed in the people I worked with in argument and also in rhetoric where I worked with Carlin Campbell and Will Linkugel and Lee Griffin. I always say, given all the mentors I had, I, I really should have been somebody. But it's, it's been, uh, it's, I was blessed and it's been a, a fun thing in the rest of my career. That's incredible. And I mean, I have to say the number of debate people that you have directed. I mean, I can trace my debate coach lineage to you. I worked with Jacob Thompson at UNLV, which was yeah. one of your advisees. Jake's, Jake's great. Yeah, I mean, do you know how many directors of forensics or debate uh, directors you've advised? I know it offhand. Uh, I think I have, uh, at this point, I, I have 39 completed uh, PhD dissertations and roughly half of them have been directors of, you know, our directors of forensics now. That's incredible. And, and so um, that was, well, I'm continuing in, in Don Parsons' tradition in, in that regard. That's incredible. Yeah, and some of my co-authors, Sarah uh, Partlow, who I've written Sarah, papers. Sarah, Sarah is absolutely fantastic, wrote a fantastic dissertation, um, had, did a lot of work, in making the point that argument was at the core of the feminist project because you know, there were no ar good arguments for not treating women, uh, all genders, in an equitable way, taking into account any special needs or whatever else. And so argument was at the core of the feminist project and still is, in, in my view. She, she did fabulous work. Yeah, she, she does great stuff. So where did you do your, uh, your doctoral work? I, I did an MA at Northwestern and then I came back to KU. So I did an MA in one year at Northwestern where I worked with Lee Griffin and, and uh, David Zarefsky especially. And then I came back to KU where I worked especially with Don Parson and Carlin Porce Campbell. Okay, awesome. And um, what do you think that argumentation offers society? Uh, argumentation is, I think, is, we should think of argument as the most humane form of decision making and is as essential in a democracy. If you think about a democracy, there are all sorts of rules, but the, the rules really come down to the principle that we ought to talk about it and all stakeholders ought to get their fair say and then we ought to decide. Well, in what situation does talking about lead to good decisions and inclusive decisions that represent everybody in the society? Well, the kind of talk that leads to that kind of decision-making is argument. 
And by argument, I mean discourse, sentences, paragraphs, books, novels, films, music videos, even tweets can make good arguments, although not, it, not so often in our contemporary political life. But it's a sentence or any of the other longer forms where you have evidence and reasoning in support of a claim. Now, I've really boiled down the Toulmin model to core components, and I can talk about how to analyze arguments in a moment. So in the, an, an argument is both a thing, but it's also a process. And as a process, it occurs as long as all the people involved are using arguments against each other. Now, when you, when you suddenly get into name calling, the kind of things that President Trump does, you've left the area of the universe of argument for insults. But in argument, you, you, where everybody is involved in reason giving and evidence citing discourse, that's at the core of democracy and an effective governance for several reasons. First, in that give and take of the argumentative process, you're more likely to discover a better solution than any other method of decision making. And the reason for that is that you know, one side says, how about this? The other side says, well, that won't work. The first side has to account for that. And in that give and take, you're more likely to avoid problems than in any other method of, of decision making. Argument, in a sense, argument is at the core of science. It's at the core of history, of any kind of research project is essentially a commitment to argument. So argument is pragmatic in that sense. But argument is also humane, because in argument, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, or black or white. It doesn't matter any, your gender, any aspect of your ethnicity, where you're from, what country you're, you are from. All that matters is that you have something sensible to say. And, and that means that power is much less important in a society which provides vehicles for everybody to be represented and to have their say. And by the way, I said earlier that that's at the core of the democratic project. And the, the primary, the most important author of American democracy, James Madison, who was the primary author of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the most important of the Federalist Papers, that's a trifecta for democratic writing. But Madison, in the most famous essay ever written about American democracy, Federalist Number 10, you know, talked about, he, he said, we needed a Republican remedy for the diseases most evident in a Republican form of government. You know, Federalist 10 is kind of a funny essay, because most of it lays out all the reasons that democracy can't work. We've got special interests, he didn't call it that. We've got partisanship, he didn't call it that, but that's what he's talking about, forces of unreason. Well, what was the Republican remedy? Well, the Republican remedy is the give and take of debate. And, and because Madison also said in Federalist 41 that a bad cause seldom fails to reveal itself. And what he meant was that over time in free and open public debate, better arguments have a way of winning out. Now, sometimes they don't win out nearly fast enough, as certainly occurred in our society on issues related to race and gender, when the better arguments were always on the side of inclusion, but you had entrenched interests and money and other factors there. But over time, uh, you know, uh, Barack Obama often would talk about how we were a nation in a state of becoming. And he meant that we were in search of a more perfect union to take the line from the, the very beginning of the Constitution. And all of that was built in a faith in, a, in, a faith in public argument, in pragmatic reason, as a method that led to better decisions, but also was humane. And, and let me add one more thing. I think argument is usually at the core of effective personal relationships, because you argue with someone you respect. You know, you're not involved in argument when you insult them. But when you respect someone, you say, okay, how about this? 
And that says, I think of you as fully human. That says, I'm willing, in what Natanson talked about, I'm willing to risk myself because anytime I'd say, what about this, there is every chance the other person's going to say, well, what about this? And my, actually, my favorite moments as a teacher in a doctoral class are when the student says, well, what about this? And I think, yeah, what about that? And I realize I've been wrong. I remember Jeff Jarman and Sarah Partlow vividly doing that to me. And that was a great day because I'd learned something. That's what argument does. Argument helps us make better decisions. It's more humane. It values everyone. It's the, it's, it should be the mode in a democracy. And it's the way to build true friendships when you listen to the other person. And you don't say, I'm in charge. You say, hey, how about this? What do you think? And then you account for their argument and they account for yours. And, and that's a great way to build a life, I think. I think that makes a lot of sense. I really like the, your vision of argumentation. It seems very much in line with a political system that respects everybody as someone endowed with reason and the capacity to advocate for themselves. I, I totally agree with that. And when I, when I read people in the literature who talk about argument as discriminating against people of color or discriminating against women or uh, people who don't, it, not a, a non-heteronormative, I think that's crazy because there are no good arguments for mistreating people of color. There are no good arguments for mistreating people who are gay or people who identify as, as hetero, uh, heterosexual and female. They're just none. And that's why people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it would come as a surprise to her that argument was anti-feminist. Think how many court cases she won when she was arguing the feminist cause. Think about Thurgood Marshall and how many court cases he won when he was uh, with the legal defense side of, of the, you know, a, a, because there were no good arguments for segregation. There are no good arguments for denying women equal rights. That's why I think argument is such an empowering form at the individual level and at the societal level. You know, I started this by talking about debate. Think about all the kids who came from, you know, nowhere, you know, West Texas or pick any state. There's a nowhere in every state. <laughs> I'm but, from New Mexico. Yeah. yeah that's a great state. Yeah. And, but who discovered that they had something to say and how much they enjoyed it when they could make a better argument and defeat Northwestern or USC or, or, or KU. You know, that's in, uh, the argument and debate as a form of argument are empowering. Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you were to describe this perspective on argument that you're espousing, what would you call it? Well, I talk about it as, um, it's associated with an American pragmatic theory of argument. So I start out with the idea that argument is a kind of, of sentence or a paragraph, whatever, in which evidence is, is cited in support of a claim and reason links the evidence to the claim. Now, in most instances, what you have are webs of evidence and webs of reasoning and a whole series of interrelated claims. That's why I don't subscribe to something like the Toolman model because I find that that kind of descriptor works only for extremely sim simple arguments. You know, I'm much more likely to take a page and simply write down as all the evidence that's cited and all the implied reasons and all the conclusions and how they're trying to take into account competing arguments in, way, in a way it may sound like I'm describing a debate flow sheet, and, and I really am describing a debate flow sheet. So we have, we have, we have a prag pragmatic reason there. And the, but the ultimate standard that justifies pragmatic theory of argument is the idea that you know, some arguments are better than others. It's possible to tell which ones and the ones that are more like the, the ones that are better than others are more likely to work. 
So let me start out at the level of kind of rule of thumb principles. And I'll give you one from practic practical world and one that's controversial in the political world, but shouldn't be. In the political world, there is a general consensus among political economists that market-based regulation is more efficient than simply having government standards. And that's the reason why it's more efficient to have a market-based regulation of sulfur oxides as they did with tradable permits that were established in the 1990 Clean Air Act reauthorization. And that's why people propose uh, it's a, a, some form of carbon tax in order to deal with global warming. Because tax, now I'm not saying the market by itself is more efficient, but what you have to do is use the market to create incentives for regulation that take into account externality. That's a rule of thumb that has been found to work across many, many areas. Now, let me give you a more pragmatic example, a more personal example. M many years ago, I wrote an essay on a pragmatic theory of argument, and uh, some people, uh, cultural critics, didn't agree, and so we had a debate uh, about that at NCA, and David Frank and I were defending the value of pragmatic argument. And in the second affirmative, the example I gave was that I make yeast bread. I did then, and I do now. And if you get the water hotter than 140 degrees when you, meet, uh, you mix in the yeast, the yeast dies and the bread doesn't rise. And it, it really doesn't matter what your symbolic system is or what perspective you have, whether you're, a, you know, you believe in Foucault or Marx or, you know, or anyone else, the yeast dies, the bread won't rise. That's a pragmatic principle. And there, Underlying argumentation theory is the quest for more basic pragmatic principles. So let me give you an example of what I think is one of the most basic pragmatic principles. Claims supported by strong evidence are more likely to be true than claims that are not supported by strong evidence. Imagine you are walking down the sidewalk and an apparently crazy person pulls their mask down and says, I think you have heart disease, you ought to see a physician. You'd walk away immediately because you'd think this is a crazy person. We hope. But if they, if they said, I am a cardiologist at the Mayo Institute, I see something in, you know, a tick in your face that would be worth looking into, it may be nothing. Then if you're sensible, you'd call your physician and make an appointment. I would do it immediately if I were in that situation. Well, what's the underlying principle? That someone who meets a standard for expertise is more likely to have knowledge within a, a subject area where their credentials are relevant. So the, the Mayo-trained cardiologist has knowledge about heart disease. Now, although he's from the Mayo Institute, that doesn't mean he knows how to make a BLT, or she knows how to make a BLT, uh, despite the, the, their, their training in, at Mayo. Um, and, and, and so you have to ask about, notice then the pragmatic principle has boundary conditions. And you'd say the same thing on examples you say the same things on statistics, and then you have more specific forms of those, of those evidence. As when I teach, I always give the example of someone in sports that is successful 30% of the time. In baseball, that's great. That's a 300 hitter. That is fabulous. Uh, in, in hockey, if you hit 30% of your shots, I think Gretzky came close to that one season. Well, you're an immortal. If you only complete 30% of your passes in the NFL, you, you don't, uh, you're, you're done. You're not going to be on the team. And so we have rules of thumb for what statistical standards demonstrate excellence. And if you know sports, those rules of thumb are pretty useful, as they are in any number of contexts. All of those are pragmatic principles that tell us when evidence uh, is stronger and therefore when we can be more trusting that something is likely to work out. Now it's not certain to work out. You know, one in a million things do happen, but 
but you know, over time, betting on the odds, you'll you'll do pretty well in Vegas with that approach. And fortunately, life is better than Vegas. So what would you call those different areas if we were to extrapolate from your example of using statistics in the different sports, if we were to take that into the regular life? Do you have a word for that? Well, it's just part of my pragmatic theory of, of argument. That argument is a form of, of that where evidence and reasoning are cited in support of a claim, and then we develop rules of thumb, pragmatic principles at, that, are, that are at various levels of, uh, you know, of abstraction that are useful. And I, let me give credit to Nicholas Rescher, who has written about a, a similar sorts of ideas. He was a, a student of logic and argument at the University of Pittsburgh. And, and he's written about that as well, that uh, pragmatism is the justification for uh, the way we make decisions. And by the way, well, let me make one other point. Although postmodernists critique argument, the, one of the founding statements of postmodernism, a skepticism of meta-narratives, is a good example of the kind of pragmatic principle we're talking about. Now that's at a much higher level. But the, the original postmodern critique is against the idea that the Marxists, the Stalinists, the, the fascists have the ultimate answer. It's a skepticism with meta-narratives. By the way, that's a very consistent with democratic pragmatism, a democratic small d, or these days, big D too. Uh, but that skepticism of meta narrative assumes that we can identify some arguments as more dangerous than others. And that, that kind of postmodern principle, by the way, I think is very consistent with Kenneth Burke's writing about entelechy. And entelechy is the idea that humans have a tendency to push any idea to the end of the line. But in pushing it to the end of the line, you tend to make it very, very dangerous. And that, that Burkean idea of the intellectual principle as a sign of societal danger is another example of a pragmatic abstraction, a generalization that is useful and that, that can be justified uh, pragmatically. Yeah, that totally makes a lot of sense. It seems like there's a, a degree of phrenesis or practical wisdom yeah. underwriting a lot of this. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm also struck when I read the postmodern critique of argument, I think of something that Chuck Berger, who was an interpersonal scholar at Northwestern, and we only lost Chuck, I think, last year or the year before. And Chuck's as hard a social scientist as you could be. I was assigned to work with Chuck as a grader in one of his classes. And I, uh, you know, I, being a debater, I gave him the business a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I talked about his worship at the font of the computer. And Chuck said, Roland, what you don't understand is that we, none of us have believed that social science or natural sciences are a way to get to absolute truth. What they're a way to do is to find evidence that bears on the way that human beings interact with each other. And some evidence is stronger than others. So what I'm, what I'm really, what Chuck was really saying to me is that a lot of what today postmodernists say against people like me is, is really a straw man critique of ideas that no one sensible has believed for 50 years now. No one has believed in a Cartesian worldview where we're going to identify the equations behind the world. What we've believed in is that some arguments are better than others and it would be useful to find out which ones and that by doing that, it would be both more humane and we would at least avoid making stupid decisions more often. Like, let me give you one more example of the pragmatic principle. No one applying the theory that I'm talking about would have supported evading Iraq in 2003. I have a, an anecdote about that. I, I teach a large lecture class on rhetoric and I teach a system I call the informed citizen, the part of which is testing argument. <laughs> and when President Bush gave his speech in Cincinnati in October, I believe it was October of 2002, that like 10 days later, we critiqued it in class. And 
all the arguments were on one side that Bush wasn't making a very strong case. Argument would have said either don't do this or don't do this before you account for these objections. I think it would have said ultimately just don't do it because it, it should have been obvious at the time that this was an, um, a very, very dangerous idea as turned out to be true. That's why pragmatic argument is useful because if nothing else, it, it, it helps us avoid really, I can only characterize this as really dumbass decisions. Yeah, if I can take a step back, one of the things I really hear you saying is that you're not a pragmatic argument isn't attempting to make absolute rules, say like um, it, people listening to this might have heard Franz's discussion of a critical discussion, which is an absolute set of norms that are transcendent, but rather you're trying to help people make relative decisions based on the circumstances that they're in, which are based on the uh, you know, relative merits of what's going on. Right, the, the closest thing to an absolute rule would be, you know, you, um, you, for example, in the classroom, if people wanna make any argument they want to, that's fine, but I don't allow anything that's racist. I don't, I, I don't allow, do, do you, you know, demeaning people based on their gender or their ethnicity, their religion. It seems to me that principles of respect for all but everybody, critiquing ideas is fine. Critiquing identity is not okay in a democratic society. Uh, and, that's, and that's a fundamental principle that comes out of respecting the humanity of all people. Uh, so I, I think the closest to absolute rules that you can get are in uh, respect for everyone in a society. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Like that that might be attacking some person is beyond the pale of looking at the reason or weighing the merits of a potential argument, which I guess it naturally leads us to the second question, the next question I wanted to ask you, which I think is important. So we've talked a lot about your approach to argumentation, but what exactly is an argument? Well, like I said, it's a claim that's supported by evidence and reasoning. And it's usually a web of evidence and reasons. It's, it's usually, and they're, they're tied together in, in various forms. And that's why I find some of the descriptive models, I mentioned the Toolman model, they're descriptive models that come from the informal logic side. I, I don't find those very useful. To me, the best descriptive model I, Know, would be a, a blank page of a, a legal pad and I'd start writing down all the evidence and all the implied reasons and all the claims that are made. Like I said, it, maybe it's my debate training. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by the way, I can't imagine how people who flow on uh, computers, I, they, it must be a gift from the gods as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but um, I, I, I try to write down everything they say and then think it through. So if I'm hearing you right, an argument, if we're understanding it as a product, because I like the distinction you introduced earlier between a product and a process, could have multiple reasons supporting it. Oh, it yeah. could have lots of evidence supporting it. And it might, so could you give us an example of one of these webs that you might be thinking about? Or Well, uh, let me give an example of, uh, a speech by President Obama, the speech that he gave before the joint session of Congress on health care reform that got very good reviews at the time. And then Obama was widely panned. Um, you know, and he was accused of being professorial. He was accused of being dull. And I always say that when people accuse Obama of being professorial, that's just proof that they've not been in a classroom with a real professor in a long time, because Obama is so much better than any professor I know at least. Me <laughs> but o Obama had made a really sophisticated argument for the need for health care reform, and then a series of refutative arguments where he accounted for the objections. And people didn't like those arguments. But over time, it turned out what he said actually worked. And the Affordable Care Act was not very popular until the Trump administration, when they tried, worked very, very hard to get rid of it. And then people real, started to realize 
that the Affordable Care Act protected them against pre-existing conditions. That people on Medicaid suddenly and say, oh, I'm, I'm, that's where I get my health insurance. They didn't realize. They thought the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare were two different things. And what happened was that the strong arguments that President Obama made became, to take an idea from Perlman, they became present. They had presence in people's lives. And now the Affordable Care Act has uh, pretty strong support. You know, the last time I looked, it was at 54 or 56 percent, which in our highly polarized society is about as strong a sport as you possibly can get. And, it, and if you look at the polling on the ideas in the Affordable Care Act, oh, it's much higher than that. Almost, it is very, very strong support. And that tells you that at the level of the intellectual debate, Obama won the argument. And yeah. over time, that argument had more and more power because people were afraid of losing something that they liked. It became present in their life. Right. I think we're freezing. That's the power. Run. I think we froze a little bit. That's the power was the last thing I heard. Uh, yeah, that's the power of, of rational argument. It, you know, making, it works better in the long run when you can see the result. And you know, one of the problems in a democratic society is that uh, the rational argument works best for the people who are paying attention in the short term, who have a lot of knowledge. But in, in the longer term, Madison's insight was, in the longer term, we experience the influence of argument. That's why when, as soon as Jefferson said, you know, all men are created equal, all people are created equal, we'd say now. Well, Jefferson lived in a society where at first, that's revolutionary when Jefferson says it. But it, that didn't mean it, it didn't include women. It certainly didn't include slaves. It didn't include people of color. It didn't include people who didn't have property in, in large parts. It was not a very democratic society. But the idea that Jefferson was presenting, it applied to everyone. All people are created equal. And since all of the people who were excluded that I mentioned, since they're people too, ultimately it was only going, <coughs> going to go one way. Because it, the, the ultimate argument behind <coughs> the gay rights movement, the civil rights movement, the women's rights, all the rights movement is, hey, I'm a person. Since there are no good reasons to deny any of the, any of the groups I mentioned or anybody the right to have their say, if democracy is working right, it moves in the direction of including the representation of everybody. That's what Obama was talking about in, at the end of, in the conclusion of his, actually it's his concession speech in the New Hampshire primary in 2008, where he talks about, gives examples of all sorts of groups that have made progress and he says, mm. We're having a little bit of struggle in here. In the unlikely history of America, there's never been anything false about hope. And the reason, so tell me where to, where you want me to pick that up. Uh, the last thing I heard, I'm sorry, my internet decided to be unstable here, um, was that you're talking about the concession speech. And then it got frozen. So I heard you say that. Okay, here we go. The concession speech, and then it, it froze. I, I, uh, th this is something I say all the time, so I, I think I've got this. In the, consensus, in the concession speech in the New Hampshire primary, where he'd unexpectedly lost to Hillary Clinton, he talked about progress and this idea that America was a more perfect, in search of a more perfect union. But then he said that in the unlikely story of America, there's never been anything false about hope. Why is that? Well, because there are no good arguments against including all of the groups we've talked about. All of, you know, African Americans, women, gay people, people of every possible ethnicity, of every gender, are people. 
and therefore they ought to have their say in a democratic society. They ought to count too. Yeah. And so when pragmatic works, and it does not work fast in, in many cases, but when it works, that's why it's, it's led to greater inclusion. Think about how controversial gay marriage was 15 years ago. Uh, the Republicans used it in the 2004 general election to help reelect Bush because the majority of people were against it. And now they're very strong majorities for gay marriage because it's just the nice couple down the street because gay people are just people and therefore ought to have the same rights as anybody else. That's pragmatic argument working over time, especially when it becomes present in our life. One of, the th one of the things I really like that I'm hearing you say is there almost seems to be a synchronic versus a diachronic account of argumentation in your theory, right? Like a synchronic, right. an immediate account of argumentation in which we're talking about claims and reasons and that we can think about it in the traditional sense. But it seems like you're making a diachronic account of argumentation, which says in the long term, we can see it bending towards uh, a theory of yeah. rights. Well, and, and you're essentially quoting Obama, who, who was quoting King, uh, you know, that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And it bends toward justice because of the power of argument. It's John Adams who said, facts are stubborn things indeed. And by the way, John Adams was defending, that was British soldiers, uh, at, you know, who were accused during the, 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 the in, at, the, at the, very, the struggles that eventually led to the revolution. And facts are stubborn things. We ignore them at our peril. Why is there so much more belief in global warming today than there was 15 years ago? I think extreme weather events that have become so common is the reason. We have seen the manifestations of global warming in ordinary life. And you know, that's what Adams was talking about. Uh, when he when he pointed to the stubbornness of facts, yeah, that that totally makes sense. So, um, how do you identify when uh, like the synchronic version of argumentation occurs? Well, the synchronic version is just you know argument as product. So you you that's when you you've got your claim that's supported by evidence and reasoning. And I've written a series of things. Uh, about what I call the liberal public sphere. And the liberal public sphere, this is just an approach to analyzing how good a job are we doing in arguing about public, public policy. And there are four actors in the liberal public sphere. There are the representatives of the public, like Congress or the president. There's the public, and that's all of us. Our job is to pay enough attention that we can make some kind of sensible choice. Then, uh, then you've got the media whose job is to reflect the debate, so in a sensible way. And then you've got the expert community whose job is to say, well, this is a specialized area, here's what we know to the best of our knowledge. You know, not truth, but here's where the balance of data is right now. And I've, I've done a series of, of studies of how the liberal public sphere is doing and the, the short answer is often not that well, and especially the, the public is so easily distracted and, you know, by, and there's so much bias and prejudice out there. A good example is the, the furor over undocumented immigrants that President Trump has used again and again to produce support. Well, the truth is that uh, und undocumented immigrants do not commit massive amounts of crime. They actually commit fewer crimes per person than native-born citizens. In, in a sense, you dilute the crime rate with more undocumented immigrants. They work harder than native-born Americans. That's, that's not hard to observe in many of my, you know, many of my undergraduate students. Um, it, it, it not, it's not true. Uh, and, and, and so that tells you that, and, and by the way, why, why does it resonate if it's not true? Well, it, it, it draws on societal prejudices, but it resonates most strongly in places where there aren't many undocumented immigrants. 
in the on the coast and in areas where there are many uh, immigrants, that stuff doesn't fly because they've got neighbors, they've got friends, they know how hard people work. You go to Western Kansas where you have undocumented immigrants working in meatpacking plants and people don't look down on them at all because they're their neighbors. They know they work hard. And, and so the, the point is that despite the flaws in what you were talking about, argument as product or the synchronic effect, over time, as, as Adam said, that was the Boston Massacre, he was defending the British soldiers. Um, facts still are stubborn things, although I will say they're a little less stubborn in Trump's America than they have ever been before. Yeah. How do you go about analyzing arguments? Well, you know, um, I, I gather representative texts, I take notes, um, I, I think about why things resonate with real audience, because I'm concerned not just with the words on the page, I'm concerned with how the argument is functioning in a democracy. That's the, the liberal public sphere studies. This only works for us at the Alta conference or at the Amsterdam conference. You know, that's not good enough. We need it to work better in the larger society. But that's, um, that's one of the reasons I've been interested in studying presidential debates, because I think there may be ways to influence format to make them um, more uh, useful. And so, um, in, a, in a way, I guess I'm saying I've, I've taken the approach of a judge in a debate, and I've applied it in, as, a, as a, a scholar. And I, I, try to, I try to balance the arguments on all the sides. I, I think it's important to sample widely the argument. Now, that's a little bit difficult because of the echo chamber of the crazy right. Let me just give you an example of that. In the Reagan years, the Heritage Foundation was a real think tank. The Heritage Foundation is not a think tank anymore. It's a, primarily a propaganda outfit. But there are, the American Enterprise Institute is still a conservative think tank. And if I'm, if I'm analyzing a debate about some public policy issue, sure, I want to look at the center left of places like Brookings and, uh, and other liberal think tanks. But, but I know that the AEI is going to give me a small government market oriented conservative perspective and I'd want to look at them. I, that's not what I personally think very often of, or really ever as a citizen. But as a scholar, you know, my theory is you got to take into account the, you know, the, the principal arguments on all the sides. Just like as a debate coach, I'd say, well, we may not agree with this, but let's go cut those cards so we know what they say and we can figure out how to answer them. That makes a lot of sense. So you, what, one of the things I'm hearing you say is that you want to understand and situate when you're analyzing it within the larger discursive or political milieu, and that includes looking at both sides of the controversy. That's right. That's right. But I, I've never seen a time when the balance of argument was so imbalanced. You know, on many, on many points, there really just is no, there's only the pragmatic liberal side. You know, Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist and, and New York Times columnist says that reality leans center left. Mm -hmm. What he really means is that if you look at the balance of arguments that are out there on a host of issues in politics and economics, really almost all the arguments are on what we would call the center left. Think, for example, about income inequality. What are the good arguments for the current extreme level of in income inequality? I am unaware of any. They haven't led to more productivity. It hasn't led to more economic growth. It's not led to more income for all. You know, when, when Reagan said, let's cut the top uh, growth rate, that will lift all boats. Well, you know, that top marginal rate was 70% then. There was an argument. Now, it didn't work, but there was an argument. But after it didn't work for Reagan, that was 1981 when that bill was passed. After it didn't work for Reagan, there haven't been any good arguments for tax cuts 
disproportionately focused on the high income bracket since then. That's 39 years ago. But how many times have conservatives argued we need to cut rates on the rich again? Well, you know, the, the value of my approach is, you know, when you look at the when you look at the give and take, you realize there just aren't good arguments on that side. That's why in the George W. Bush and the Trump tax cuts, <coughs> their advocacy, they basically claim that it would help the middle class to bite the fact that their even their own data didn't say that. You know, that's why it's important to take, you got to focus on the details. Well, so one of the things that I'm hearing you say is good argument a lot. And I was wondering if you can unpack that a little bit. What constitutes a good argument? Good arguments are ones that are pragmatically useful. Yeah, and tell me that, more. So that, this, this, that's the standard that leads. So I was talking about the tax cuts. Yeah. When, uh, when the, the tax cuts were proposed by the Trump administration, they claimed that it was going to unleash all the, the, I'm talking about the corporate tax cuts for illustrative purposes, that it was going to unleash all this investment and productive growth. Paul Krugman and other liberals said, in the past, first, that hasn't happened. Second, absent increases would invest in more factories, et cetera, they're satisfying the demand as it is. In recent years, corporations have taken profits and they bought back shares that that increased share price that went back to the shareholders rather than investing in, in uh, R&D. And he said, based on history and their own incentives, this is not going to produce increases in productivity. It's not gonna produce increases in jobs and it's not going to trickle down to the, the even the upper middle class. There was considerable history supporting what Krugman said and in fact it is it came to pass in that the Trump tax cuts did not produce any of the things that the Trump administration predicted. In fact the, the Trump economy was simply a straight line extension of the Obama economy, despite vastly more stimulus that Trump had than, uh, than Obama could get in 2009 when we desperately needed stimulus. But the, the limits of our political system led to um, the stimulus that was way too far. So pragmatic arguments are ones that turn out to be useful in the long term, that, that that predict things that actually happen. You know, so, you know, to put it in sports terms, and I've been a Kansas City Chiefs fan for 50 years, more than 50 years. I remember the first Super Bowl one, that's uh, 50, 55 years ago, and Super Bowl four and 54 were, were terrific. Those are the two we won, last year included. Well, I remember all the quarterbacks in, you know, in, in the interim. I remember Steve DeBerg. When Steve DeBerg goes back to pass and Patrick Mahomes goes back to pass, the chance of a touchdown is infinitely higher with Patrick Mahomes based on his statistics, you know, his, his receivers, et cetera. Pragmatic argument was what led and um, the Chiefs to draft Mahomes, they looked at a lot of tape and they said, this guy's a little raw, but my God, he can make plays that no one else can make. And to this point, and, and may the gods of injury stay far away, to this point, their pragmatic argument has certainly turned out to be true. Pragmatic yeah, well, arguments are useful. That's, that's what makes them good. And they're also humane. That also makes them good. The pragmatic argument is probably what got him paid. You see that he just signed the largest half, half, a, half a billion dollars over the next 12 years. Yeah, he's, I think, a lifelong chief now. Yeah, he's a good quarterback. May that, may that please be true. I'm, I'm long suffering. I mean, I remember the Chiefs, you know, I, the last time in, in, in the 55 years I've been a Chiefs fan, we had Len Dawson at the beginning. And we had three years of a fading Joe Montana. And now we've had two years of Patrick Mahomes. But I'm talking about, that's about 
oh, eight, 10. That's about a quarter of the time have we had a really good quarterback, less than a quarter of the time. That means 40 some years of, oh no, not another <laughs> interception now. Oh, the AFC West. Uh, rough, that, rough. In, in, in the old days, the AFC West, the, and again, a pragmatic reason in that period was our great defense. The, uh, the, the, the early Chiefs, the 66 to 72 Chiefs, uh, f- five starters on the defense are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They, wow. were, they were pretty good pragmatic arguers, too. Yeah. Well, let me say, actually, let me say something about the Chiefs that's actually relevant. Yeah. One of the things that Hank Stram did, Hank Stram looked at pro football and said, there are an awful lot of good black athletes, but the NFL is not using them because they have, in essence, a quota. Well, that's dumb. The, a black athlete who's a really good player ought to play in the league. And they're just people like us. And so the Chiefs had a black scout. The, one of the first teams in maybe the first team in, in a pro football. And they, and they went to historically black colleges and many of the greatest chiefs uh, were, uh, are, are, they're still alive, black Americans. And the chiefs said, this is right. But, and they also said, these are great players. Uh, and Lamar Hunt would take one of the famous, the old black chiefs to restaurants and integrate the restaurant because Lamar Hunt was a, the equivalent of a billionaire and they wouldn't turn him down. And, and that was a pragmatic argument that was also an argument for justice. And that's, that's the advantage of believing in pragmatic reason is you're arguing for things that are sensible, that are likely to work out, but you're also arguing for humanity and justice at the same time. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an old romantic liberal. Yeah, no, there ain't nothing wrong with having a little bit of hope in the system. Ain't, ain't that the truth. So can you give a contemporary example? I, 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 I'm really interested in our contemporary age. It's easy to look and say, right, it's easy to value reason and then turn around and see our moment where... I'm willing to bet, in fact, I have a well-placed bet, and this is not going to make my content very evergreen, that the president is not going to debate this year, um, that there is not a lot of value in reason because people are unwilling to engage one another in the prospect of reason giving. Well, I think you're, you're certainly right that in, in 2016, the debate was not very productive because Trump didn't treat it as a debate. He tried he treated it as a chance to give a rally speech. Um, but I would, I think that uh, as the effects of Trump policies have become present in people's life, and I'm going back to, to Perlman, they've become extraordinarily unpopular. So for example, he sold us the, you know, the fear of the caravans of undocumented immigrants. It was always garbage. But when we saw children being separated from their parents in something that is just unvarnished evil. Uh, That was an extremely unpopular policy. When he shut down the government for the wall, and it turned out we needed a government. That was a very unpopular policy. And I think the claim that we aren't, he actually has a point about how we're number one in dealing with the the COVID virus. We have done the worst job of any developed nation in the world. You know, we may not be quite as bad as Brazil. This is not something to be proud of. You know, and, but the point is that in this case, the bad arguments, the arguments that didn't work, and then the corresponding good arguments on the other side, when they become present in people's lives, at that point, public opinion does begin to change. Now, <clears throat> who knows what will happen in the next months? But if when you look at public opinion on places where his arguments have become present in people's lives, boy, um, at that point, reason and democracy work pretty well. A really good example. Thank you. 
So, you know, in closing, I wanted to ask if you had any thoughts for up and coming argumentation scholars or anything else you think we should know. Well, I've spent a lifetime studying argument and I, I, there's just one more interesting thing to look at um, day after day after day after day. I, I joke, I've not, you know, I've never had a night on the street. I've always been too damn busy. Hmm. And that's been, that's been great. And many times it's been happenstance. Uh, I remember when Walter Fisher wrote about the narrative paradigm and it struck me that, you know, I, I believe fundamentally in the power of narrative, but if you define everything as a narrative, then for example, that segment of Obama's speech on healthcare, where he, he spends about 15 minutes just refuting the objections. Well, that looked more like an argument to me than a narrative. And it struck me that you are losing distinctions when you defined it as all the same thing. And it struck me that there was really a difference there. I, well, you know, that led to some interesting research. And it, by the way, at the end of that, I also, you know, I used the humane part of argument to make friends with Walter Fish. And there's always something interesting to write about. And the, the other advantage of working in argumentation is that often there are people who will make You froze. Oh my goodness. It's easier to make good arguments against terrible arguments than the other way. Oh, okay. Where do you want me to start again? Uh, you said often with argument, it was- oh. And the other thing, often as a scholar, you know, there are people who don't, make, who don't make good arguments, who make terrible arguments. And when you get in dialogue with them, the advantage you have is that, you know, in debate terms, all the cards are on your side. You know, when, when I said in the, I mentioned earlier the debate that David Frank and I were in, when I pointed out that uh, the, if you get the water hotter than 140 degrees, the yeast dies, the bread won't rise. You know, they didn't know quite what to say. And then they said that temperature was a symbolic construction to which I observed that they were gonna have pretty flat bread if they thought that way. The, you know, argument is, uh, writing about argument and thinking about argument has been engaging, it's been fun, but it also has been rewarding because it turns out some arguments are better than others. And that really gives you a way to build a career. and. And you're always on the side of humanity because you're always defending justice and inclusion and diversity because everybody ought to count. And I've, I've believed in that all my life. That is an excellent sentiment. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Roland. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Okay. Bye.